Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar today, uh, where we will be discussing the hydrogen economy turning vision into reality. In the first place, I wanted to thank Hydrogen Strategy Now and Bosch for organizing the webinar today. My name is uh, Marta Krajewska. I'm Deputy Director Power at Energy UK. We are the trade association for GB energy industry, and it's my absolute pleasure to chair the webinar today. Before we crack on with uh, just a few notice, notices. So this session is actually being recorded and the content of it will be available on social media afterwards. There will be plenty of opportunities to ask questions towards the end of the session. And also, as we will be discussing the very exciting topic of today, we'll actually be running a few polls with all the attendees. So I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, just to start, I'm very sure that everyone uh, will have noticed the increased attention around hydrogen and the role that technology could play not only in the global fight against climate change, but also in mm. make recovery from COVID-19 pandemics. Uh, even the UK Prime Minister mentioned hydrogen specifically in his speech earlier this week. As I'm sure we will explore today, hydrogen in its various forms appears to have huge potential to drive decarbonization in various parts of the economy, including those more challenging sectors, such as industry and heavy transport. Hence, it could play a key role in meeting the UK's emission reduction target of net zero by 2050 and could make a significant contribution to meeting the Paris Agreement globally. But action is needed now. And let me use the quote made by the International Energy Agency included in their report in 2019, which clearly mentions that we are now facing a moment of unprecedented momentum for hydrogen. So building on that unprecedented momentum, Energy UK is pleased to be part of the Hydrogen Strategy Now campaign. As part of it, we have called on the UK government to bring forward a hydrogen strategy to be part of the economic recovery coming out of COVID-19 and driving us towards a net zero economy by 2050. Uh, at the same time, we would like to see the UK government designating a minister for hydrogen working across government departments and putting their full focus on making the UK a world leader in hydrogen technology. I'm delighted that we have a distinguished panel of speakers this morning who will, I'm sure, offer us a series of diverse and fascinating perspectives. We are lucky to be joined um, by speakers from countries leading the way in hydrogen development, as well as a speaker who has been at the heart of tackling these issues within the UK government. So let's now turn to our panel. As mentioned, we have a wonderful panel of speakers today with interests in hydrogen for, from across the globe. I will now hand over to them to introduce themselves and their role in the hydrogen economy. So firstly, Dr. Kim Sehun, Senior Vice President and Head of the Fuel Cell Divisions and Hyundai Motor Company. So Dr. Thank Kim you, Marta. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm... Uh... Working, uh, I'm in charge of fuel cell technology development and uh, also uh, fuel cell system business in Hyundai Motor Company. And I was a uh, co-secretary of Hydrogen Council. I don't know whether you have heard about Hydrogen Council. We had a chairship uh, until end of uh, June. So this is uh, 2nd of July. So uh, we have handed over to Toyota, but... <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for inviting me here, and I'd like to uh, join this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, now uh, we have uh, Christopher Hugo from the German Energy Agency. So over to you, Chris. 
Thank you very much. As said, Christoph Jugel, German Energy Agency. I'm director of energy system, meaning I'm responsible for a group of several teams, several people in a working group that is focusing on two main areas. First area is the integrated energy systems. So we're focusing on thinking about how we can bring all the different um, energy carriers, infrastructures, applications, consumers, um, industry partners with, with all their different requirements together in an integrated energy system. And out of this, we had huge studies, a huge study being published in 2018, in which we were saying, hey, it's much more than just electrification. Electrification is important, but it's much more than this. We, knew, we do need, besides green electrons, we do need green molecules as well. And we are focusing, this is the second branch of my, my responsibility, we're very much focusing on green, renewable gases and liquid energy carriers and feedstocks, meaning power to gas, power to X, and all the der derivatives, um, which we understand as power fuels, everything that is produced of green electrons and is then used like hydrogen or as other things like kerosene, um, diesel, um, gasoline, ammonia, methanol, ethanol, and, and the likes. So it's very, very important that by 2050, we're finding a system that has gases and liquids that are being produced renewable, and we're working on this very heavily. Fantastic. That's great to hear. Thank you so much, Christopher. Uh, now we have Thijs Jensen from Hydrogen Ger uh, Denmark. Apologies. So over to you, Thijs. Well, well, thank you very much, Martin, and uh, and thank you for uh, in, inviting me and having me on this uh, on this panel today. It's a, it's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the I'm the CEO of Hydrogen Denmark, which is the National Danish Hydrogen Association, uh, working with. Uh, a wide range of uh, of members to to promote the cause of hydrogen in Denmark and also to to build up the the sort of the what is hopefully to become an industrial complex. Uh, uh, seeing hydrogen as key to uh, both what Mr. Hugo mentioned the green transition. Obviously, this is the justification in many ways uh, uh, that that hydrogen and hydrogen-based projects such as methanol, kerosene, etc. Can play a key role in the green transition, should and, and will have to. But secondly, also this is also a huge uh, business uh, employment opportunity for the con uh, for countries around the world, but also especially around the North Sea, uh, meaning obviously both Germany, uh, Denmark, and the UK, uh, where this uh, and and a prerequisite in many ways to harvest the the tremendous energy resource, uh, renewable energy resource that we are blessed with. Uh, in in the terms of offshore uh, wind potential in the North Sea, so a very close link there. Absolutely, thank you very very much. Last but not least, uh, we have a George Freeman MP, so Member of Parliament for Mid Mid Norfolk. So George, over to you. Great, thank you for having me, and thank you for pulling this event together. Um, so until February, I was Minister of State at the Department of Transport in the UK for the future of transport a new position created by the Prime Minister to uh, catalyze some new thinking in the UK and within the department. And I was a champion for hydrogen within that role. And um, in the February reshuffle, I was removed for not being a strong enough Brexiteer. And I've uh, told the government that I will be continuing to support them in their work on innovation and regeneration. Uh, by way of uh, came to Parliament in 2010. I had a 15-year career in technology venture capital in the UK, mainly bioscience and clean tech and agri-tech. And then in the coalition with David Cameron, I led the call for our industrial strategy and then became the first minister in the UK for life science uh, and for bioscience and the bioeconomy. Um, so I'm now a freelance backbench MP uh, committed to promoting innovation and regeneration and how the two support each other in the UK. Fantastic. Thank you so much, George. Uh, so let's start our discussion and heading into the actual debate. So I am going to start quite broadly, as you've probably heard in my opening remarks, I've mentioned what the International Energy Agency mentioned about the unprecedented momentum for hydrogen. So what do you think of that statement? Do you agree with that? And actually where we are with the development of hydrogen in general. So shall I start with you, Kim? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always a little bit difficult to start. Uh, 
I would like to, uh, st I know, I, I would like to uh, think about, you know, uh, the energy transition. So yeah. uh, Jeremy Rifkin has said uh, it's a third industry revolution. And first we had coal, second we had oil. But now I think it is time to use renewable energy. And if we want to do use renewable energy, hydrogen is the key element. Mm -hmm. So uh, I saw the German national uh, hydrogen uh, strategy. Uh, it, I was very happy to see that, and you may know better. But if we, if we summarize that uh, roadmap, it is just saying that before, in the past, we our technology and industry was all about collecting oil, delivering oil, and using oil. And now, in the future, it will be collecting sunshine, mm -hmm. delivering sunshine, and using sunshine. And that will uh, what will that make possible is hydrogen. So we have to materialize the sunshine and transport. And we have to use not only as a fuel, but we have to uh, use it for raw materials for ammonia fertilizer production, uh, semiconductor industry, uh, steel industry, and everywhere. So I'm uh, de developing fuel cell as a part of how to use this renewable energy. But I think there will be a whole industry chain uh, because uh, it includes the renewable energy technology like solar and hydro and wind. And we have to have electrolyzers if we want to produce uh, uh, hydrogen in uh, where the sun is uh, rich, like North Africa. We have to have desalination uh, devices and we have to transport that and ship industry have to move. And overall, so... But particularly in the mobility side, we have been focusing on passenger vehicles. Mm -hmm. And many people say we are competing with battery, but I think we are really actually uh, coexist. Because in some countries where the renewable is uh, plentiful, then they could directly use electricity and use a uh, battery and uh, battery electric cars. But some country has to import renewable and if they uh, import as a form of hydrogen, a hydrogen car can be more effective than the electric cars. But uh, there is still competition in the cost and the performance. But today, the truck industry, a truck, there is no other uh, option for the powertrain. Battery will be too heavy anyway. So uh, I think uh, truck and bus uh, sector is getting more momentum. And, uh, and we are preparing the technology for that. So passenger, I think we have <clears throat> reached the level of technology already, but for truck and buses, we need a little bit more for longer durability. Uh, and we have to move to ship, mar maritime. And we also have to do aerospace, uh, mm -hmm. like plane and uh, UAM, urban uh, air mobility and so on. And we have a lot of powertrain, uh, I mean, power generate as a power generator, like uh, backup power and other uh, sources. So there will be enormous uh, chances to uh, expand the economy or grow, grow the economy because it is not only one technology sector, but whole energy will change, Absolutely. basic energy will change. So, Let's just imagine how much industry has been involved from the oil industry, starting from oil. So hydrogen will revival that, but more cleaner way. So I think we have many, many chances for all the country and all the technical area. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kim. That's, that's very encouraging to hear. I am probably right now going to move to Christoph, then to Tice, and then to George, if that's okay. Uh, so Christoph, exactly, what, what is your view about, about the momentum for hydrogen now? And, and can you tell us a little bit in terms of what you're doing in Germany? We'll see. First, Kim, thank you very much for your introduction. I know it's hard to start. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you opened up this. Hey, in the past, we've been so much discussing about oil and we've been thinking about how to get it and how to make best use of it. And this has to change. The future is going to be 
um, about the sun. And I'd like to frame it a little different. Or that, like, I'd like to use different words saying that green hydrogen is the daughter of renewable electrons. We have to make sure that we fully understand this. But green hydrogen is much more because green hydrogen is also the mother of renewable gases and liquid energy carriers and feedstocks. So what's very important when we're discussing about hydrogen is that hydrogen has a special role in the future energy systems. It's not, repeat, it's not the silver bullet for solving all of our problems. It's not the one solution that helps at all, but it has a special role. And the special role is twofold. First thing is that hydrogen can have direct impact on reducing local um, emissions because it's there is many, many different applications in which we can use hydrogen as locally emission-free applications. For example, in transport and industry sectors to avoid process-related greenhouse gas emissions. Second role is the indirect role of hydrogen. Green hydrogen is the basis for renewable production of gas with liquid energy carriers and feedstocks. Mm -hmm. And this is very important. And this is very important for politics to please understand the special role of hydrogen because there's four very important reasons why power fuels, so green electricity-based energy carriers and feedstocks are really important. First is they offer a climate-friendly solution to applications with no viable alternative out of our today's perspective. Second, those power fuels, hydrogen and others, um, allow us to further use existing infrastructures and devices, which leads to much lower overall costs of the energy transition. Mm -hmm. Third in there is that green hydrogen, or well, no, actually it's power fuels, uh, are a green drop-in alternative to fossil fuels and their der derivatives in many different infrastructures and devices which allows for an easy ramp up independently of future changes in the application areas. And the fourth, and this is the one I'd like to highlight most, or I'd like to focus on most, is that power fuels and green hydrogen allows to make local potentials of renewable energy production being mm -hmm. traded on global markets. And this is something that's absolutely new. We've never seen this before. Um, Kim, you were saying we have to make sure we're focusing on collecting sun, trading sun, using sun, that has not, be, not been possible in the past, but with hydrogen and other mm -hmm. power fuels, this is possible as power fuels can be stored over long periods of time and can be transported over long distances. There's existing trading structures, there's existing infrastructures and financing risk management and all this stuff. So it's very important that we make sure to fully understand this twofold special role of hydrogen and locally emission free and facilitator for many different um, users then. And said, having said this, last sentence on this, this is a global challenge and a global chance that allows many new countries, new kids on the block to actually <laughs> participate in global energy markets. And this is a huge chance also for um, working together with developing countries, working together with new industrial partners, reducing, um, well, the, the strong bounds that have hindered um, economic development in the past in some ways. So it is just a huge chance globally. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christoph. So now over to you, Thais. You've mentioned in your introductory remarks the importance of North Sea and, and kind of how you see the role of hydrogen from, from that perspective. So indeed, is that an unprecedented moment for the North Sea area? <laughs> Well, well, yes, I think so. I think it is. Uh, obviously, we have, I mean, I tend to use the picture that we've been used to harvesting energy from the North Sea, at least uh, most of the countries, uh, uh, for the last, well, 30 years at least, but in the forms of fossil fuels. Now we're, so we have to stop that, and then, but the North Sea will still be a source of a, a tremendous energy resource. Uh, one that is a little bit harder in some ways to, to, to harvest, not that we, we cannot do these huge wind farms and we cannot use the very large potential mm -hmm. but if we are to um, use the energy get the energy ashore in the right manner uh, and not least distribute it and get it into the sectors that we that we need not just in in our current electricity consumption but into the energy system as a whole we need uh, the sort of the the transformation into hydrogen and for the obvious reasons that uh, both uh, uh, Mr. Ugal and uh, and Dr. Kim mentioned uh, uh, so, and here hydrogen is absolutely key. Uh, it is the only key. I mean, we can use uh, much more of the potential in the North Sea, um, creating much more offshore wind, uh, 
and, and harvesting that potential if we convert a lot of that energy to hydrogen is the only way. And, and obviously in other parts of the world, in, in, around the Mediterranean, Middle East, North Africa, uh, solar is, is obviously a different, uh, an obvious path. But for us in, 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 in this part of Europe, in this part of the world, this is, this is an actually golden opportunity that nature mm -hmm. has bestowed us as a very windy uh, environment uh, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, an energy potential that is, 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 a, is, a, is a golden opportunity for us to, to use for, for the, those of us who are lucky enough to be situated around this resource. But it requires Brilliant. hydrogen, otherwise we can't do it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, Thais, for that. Last but not least, George, I wanted to ask you, uh, we're talking a lot about golden opportunities. We talk a lot about reducing local emissions. What do you think hydrogen, what is the role that hydrogen could play, for example, in your constituency? Well, look, firstly, can I echo the comments that have been made? I think we Absolutely. are there is a huge opportunity. And 25 years ago, when I was reading climate science in Cambridge, and we were debating whether climate change was real and um it's very clear in this and i've always been confident that we would find some renewable energy sources um and i think this is one part of the mix key point uh, this isn't a silver bullet um huge opportunity in the uk um the new government is committed to a major i mean we're talking huge spending on leveling up it's a hundred billion pound investment in leveling up is a whole program from boris johnson about reaching out to connect um, our coastal marginal communities to the London model of growth rather better. Uh, a massive increase in our science and R&D, which I've been leading the charge and calling for. A £400 million package of investment in buses. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity in the UK. Um, and I think there's an opportunity actually for Europe here. While America is pretty dependent on oil and pretty focused on the oil supply and the geopolitics of oil, Middle East similarly, and China still, I mean, investing heavily in tomorrow's technology. To me, there's an opportunity for Europe, and I'd like the UK, even if we're not in the political union, to be part of a technology collaboration with you on. Let me just be blunt about the barriers. In the UK, um, there's been a general problem of people lobbying kind of silver bullet, the hydrogen society, all problems solved. That doesn't cut it with ministers. We need tangible solutions to yeah. hear our problems. That is changing very fast, much better lobbying. Mm -hmm. There's been an issue about green hydrogen, which has really confused the market. People saying, well, hydrogen isn't green unless it's made with renewable, renewably sourced electricity. Um, thirdly, we've got a problem with the initial upfront cost of procurement. So I'm trying to persuade DFT to buy hydrogen buses and the officials say, well, they cost uh, three or four hundred thousand pounds versus an uh, electrical bus of 200. But if you did a whole supply chain costing and factored in the recycling, the waste disposal, then it's very different. And if you, as we did on the genomics industrial strategy, commit to buy 3,000, the price soon falls. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, I think there's a technical issue about distribution. Mm -hmm. It's not clear to people quite what the national distribution system would be, uh, which is why I suggested in the UK we do five hydrogen hubs mm -hmm. at, at coastal locations close to offshore wind. Aberdeen, Teesside, Southern North Sea, Bristol, Northern Ireland. And then we could build at least five hub towns with full hydrogen buses, hydrogen cars, hydrogen lorries, create some clusters while we work out how we link them up in a national system. Those, I think, are the big barriers, yeah. but a huge opportunity, which we would be failing the next generation if we don't grab. Fantastic. Thank you so much, George. And also, thank you very much for doing a really introduction into kind of the next big topic of, of today, which is indeed about the barriers. And right now I am going to make it a slightly more um, collaborative. Uh, basically, we are going to display a quick poll on the screen. Uh, Helen and Richard will be in charge, which indeed the question relates to the single biggest barrier to adoption of hydrogen energy. Uh, so uh, there are four responses here. Uh, I'm going to leave all of you maybe 30 seconds. I also encourage all the panelists to participate. Uh, I'm quite keen actually to see what the result of that will be. Um, and apart from the polls, we are going to have two more questions. So bear with us. Uh, I also obviously encourage all the participants to start asking the questions on the chat. I can already see some fabulous questions 
and make sure we address all of them or most of them later on. So uh, write, so please submit your responses and shall we get the results? Right. Okay. That's, that's very, very interesting. So as you can see, uh, it's uh, in terms of the single biggest barrier to adoption of hydrogen energy. Uh, so our, our audience, everybody see, see actually two big issues. First is the lack of governmental coordination and the lack of awareness and understanding of its potential. Um, I am quickly going to ask George first, uh, what you make uh, of, of this results and, and if there's anything else you would like to add in terms of barriers that you see. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's difficult to comment not knowing where all of the <laughs> participants are voting. Fair for. enough, yeah. <laughs> I, I would definitely concede that there has been a lack of coordination in the UK. Uh, our energy sector has been, or energy department, has been walking around Whitehall trying to find a home for years. Mm -hmm. It now sits in the Department of Energy and Industrial Strategy, which um, is good. Um, it used to be energy and climate change, its own department. So I think that is a problem. But yeah. I, I think there's a, to me, in the UK, I can only really comment in the UK. The, the big challenge, I think, is that the, the EV and the electrical, the battery industry, uh, has established a very strong position and it's sort of unquestioned now. And if you question it in the UK, you're deemed to be questioning the green economy, which is bonkers. Mm -hmm. And I, I echo the point that Kim made at the beginning. Um, to me, there's a very powerful opportunity in haulage, yeah. in buses, in tractors, in uh, diggers and in shipping and potentially in trains as well. Interestingly, in the UK, Network Rail tell me that they're not proposing to fully electrify the whole of our network. Yeah. In the marginal areas, guess what? The areas next to the offshore wind, they're proposing to go a mixture of uh, clean diesel and hydrogen. So I think the problem is that people in the UK have thought of clean energy means electrical. Mm -hmm. and we haven't had a mixed economy approach. Absolutely. No, I, I, I would totally agree with that. And right now, moving from the UK experience, I'm actually going to turn to the Danish experience. Uh, and if you could uh, let us know as well from the Danish perspective, what are the biggest barriers in terms of making sure that hydrogen becomes not only a vision, but a reality? Yeah, well, obviously there, there, are, there are barriers. I think some, some has been mentioned very precisely already. I think from here, um, uh, Cost is obviously one thing, uh, as, as also was mentioned by George, the way you, you both approach cost and the actual cost they can both be uh, a barrier for the deployment of hydrogen technologies and sort of the, the fulfillment of the, the huge potential. Uh, and, and, and secondly, um, also the uh, yeah, actually, not, not so much the cost or the ability to produce hydrogen in large quantities, but that's pretty uh, approachable in many ways. But that, that where we uh, see a challenge is actually utilizing the hydrogen. Uh, unlike other countries, uh, for instance, uh, Germany or the, the, the low countries, are, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't have a sort of uh, traditional industrial hydrogen consumption to sort of kick off the decarbonization process. So it will need to be utilized uh, within transportation uh, or uh, uh, or new industrial processes, and there is a lack still of uh, um, um, yeah of correct um, yeah, word um, yeah the uh, units uh, uh, buses yeah. trucks etc. Uh, obviously, uh, Dr. Kim and and uh, both his co colleagues and competitors are working hard on on the matter, but it is still a need for more uh, appliances to be to be used. And that sort of but obviously you don't put them on the market until the demand is there. And I think that has been a lot of explanation. So we're reaching sort of a, uh, in a positive sense, a perfect storm where we're seeing much more development. We're also seeing that we're realizing sort of the renewable potential. Now we are there where we can start producing hydrogen meaningfully green. Uh, and secondly, that the costs are coming down due to industrialization, but still there is, there's a, 
a uh, little bit of a chicken and egg problem and also cost uh, issue at barriers but 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 the the big difference uh, uh, to just i mean two or three years ago here locally in Denmark but also on a european level from from Brussels and with the uh, with the strategy for germany for instance which is something used important in europe which is the political will actually to to invest and to move this from from potential to, to deployment let's say so, so yes, strong barriers still in place, but really uh, barriers are falling like dominoes at the moment, luckily. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. Uh, so over to you, Christoph. Could you could you elaborate a bit about the barriers? Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much for this poll. I like the results, and they don't surprise <laughs> me at all. Um, what I like a lot was that the first most mentioned or most chosen answer was lack of governmental coordination. This is actually yeah. something that. Uh, we all could have uh, could see in Germany over the past month, actually. Um, last year in 2019, we had a huge um, strategic dialogue between the Federal Ministry of Energy and, and the economy with the stakeholders out there. It was called GAS 2030, and we as German Energy Agency were helping them doing this. And mm -hmm. at the end of this process, um, the government promised to publish the hydrogen strategy, national, national hydrogen strategy, actually in December 2019 and we just published it in June 2020 so this actually um, tells everybody who was clicking on governmental coordination is missing yes you're right but at the same time it shows us that this topic today and for the first time is important for everybody in all the yeah. different ministries. So it took so long because it's been five different federal ministries together publishing this national hydrogen strategy. It's been the Ministry of Economy and, and Energy, the one for environment, the one for um, research and, and development, uh, the one for, what, what is it, transport, uh, mm -hmm. and the fourth is for international um, coordination and development. So very important having all those together. And of course it yeah. takes a little bit longer if you're having five federal ministries together in publishing a paper. George can for sure <laughs> agree in this. So, but this is very important. This is important that right now it's all in and yeah. it takes a little longer and it might look like they're uncoordinated. Yes, they are, but it's important having all of them in there, very important. Second thing is um, this lack of awareness and understanding of the potential um, yeah. with the second rated um, option here also shows us what we are, already have already said in here this is just not a silver bullet that can help mm -hmm. solve all problems so of course not everybody do see and uh, everybody sees the same potential of hydrogen because it's just not having the same potential for everybody yeah. it's very important that this is nothing this is not a bad thing having this in here but actually what one thing that i personally would would say was missing in those options in here you were saying yeah. hey Cost of production might be a barrier, but what's the most important problem is lack of market value of mm -hmm. low carbon fuels, of low carbon energy carriers and low carbon feedstocks. This is the most important problem. This is something that we together, George, have to tackle down in, in Brussels, making sure that Europe, the European Union and, and our friends in uh, <laughs> close to the European Union, together make sure that green gases, green energy carriers, green fuels, green feedstocks do have a higher value than their fossil counterparts. And this is the most yeah. important problem I'm saying, besides the still too high um, cost of production, but cost of production will change with cost regression going down, with um, further reduction in cost for um, generating renewable electricity. So, so this, all, all this is going down, but what's important is something going up, and this is the market value of green solutions. And this is something that has to be tackled on a political area, on a political um, stage then. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Christoph. I am now going to turn to uh, Dr. Kim. I hope you can hear us all right. Uh, yeah, so can you hear me? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Very, very clear. So a quick question. Did those results surprise you that, that you saw on the poll? And actually, are there any other barriers that we have obviously missed when asking uh, our, our dear audience to, to respond? <laughs> Okay, uh, sorry that I was out because uh, no our problem. Company, company's policy is at 7.30, all electricity shut down. Oh <laughs> so the computer was out. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, it's not, it was not surprising for me uh, at all mm -hmm. because uh, there is, I think, two things. First, the government people 
the uh, people working at government did not have confidence in the past. Yeah. So they don't want to be blamed after they make a policy that the hydrogen society doesn't work. So that's why they delayed and delayed and delayed. But uh, now we are seeing the change in the government. Today in Korea, I mean yesterday, the 1st of Ju uh, July, our uh, we ha ha Korean government have made Hydrogen Economy uh, Council below Prime Minister. And eight ministers are the members. And there is uh, 11 members from private sector. And these will coordinate all the uh, hydrogen. Uh, and we have, uh, you know, uh, made three dedicated organizations for hydrogen. So one is for safety, one is for uh, hydrogen, uh, you know, safety, uh, safety and industry, uh, you know, uh, stimulation. Mm -hmm. And one is, I think, uh, some safe delivery of hydrogen, I think. Uh, so, but there is three uh, organizations newly made. So now, uh, I have asked our government to make a dedicated organization in the government for 17 years, and it is uh, realized yeah, in Korea. And I saw the Korea, uh, German roadmap that they will also make such uh, organization in government. So I think it will be coordinated. But yeah. more problem is uh, the normal public's uh, knowledge, because there is not, you know, there, there is uh, people think there is not enough renewable in the world. In Korea, people are keeping asking, where is the renewable? Because they don't see mm -hmm. it now. And actually, in the study of hydrogen Europe, uh, only seven, six or seven percent of Sahara Desert uh, covered with solar will supply the whole energy for the world. And mm -hmm. even Australia alone can provide all the renewable energy for the world. So they have to know it. And they have to know that hydrogen can solve the mismatch of uh, supply and demand. And it mm -hmm. can be, it can realize that you know, a glo global trade of hydrogen for global rich, uh, you know, uh, renewable rich country to renewable arm country, poor country, mm -hmm. and it can balance everything. So I think people would, should know that first and, and uh, we have to let them be confident with the hydrogen safety side. Yeah. When we m want to make a hydrogen station in Korea, there is some still uh, worries about the safety. So mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. energy is dangerous. Yeah. It is how we, how, because energy is, you know, energy itself is dangerous thing because it has energy. <laughs> but uh, we have to find a way and make the people confident that this can be safely used and it's very clean at the same time. So I think there is many things for us to do. Yeah. Thank you. And other barriers, well, well, there's many things. Uh, for example, if we want to, uh, we are in the very early stage mm -hmm. and uh, we, we'll have to uh, develop new technologies, but the codes and standards and the regulations are different from country to country. country exactly. For example, if we want, if we make a car for, uh, uh, I mean, a fuel cell car, mm -hmm. it is okay in Europe, but it is not okay in China and it is not okay in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> so. This makes a lot of cost, yeah, and effort, and time consuming, and not, uh, uh, you know, not uh, logical. That in some areas it is fine, but other areas uh, it cannot be homologated. So I think yeah. we have to solve these kind of problems also. Thank you. Yeah. No, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Um, I am now going to actually uh, well, ask Helen and Richard to display the second poll. Uh, which will be uh, about how can business sectors increase adoption of hydrogen. So we we'll, should see it on the screen right now. There are three responses. So please vote in the next five, 10 seconds. Brilliant. Can we see the results already? Fantastic. All right. Uh, I, I have to say, well, neck and neck might be an overstatement. However, uh, it's quite close between uh, the three responses. Uh, so, so actually, our participants uh, consider that obviously more focused investment from business and government 
on sectors that will benefit the most. That is um, the, the most popular response, but, but very closely we've got the two other ones. And, and I, I actually think that this brings us nicely to the last part of that discussion because before I actually uh, take some questions from the audience, where I would like to ask for your views uh, about um, what can we do in order to make uh, our voice heard and to in order to, to make sure that the message gets across the governments and, and actually for that for that cooperation. I am going probably to ask Christoph and Thais first. Uh, Christoph, I, I kind of know and you've mentioned um, in, in your remarks that uh, obviously apart from the German hydrogen strategy that we are quite jealous of, let's face it, uh, we are also awaiting uh, some publications from the European Union when it comes to their strategy. And actually, like, what are your expectations in terms of that document? And, and generally, what needs to be done in order to get that message across? Okay, uh, ma many questions, hard to answer. <laughs> First, what, one Sorry comment, about that. <laughs> uh, well, what, one comment, Kim, thank you very much for bringing up another topic of security. Yeah. And frankly, I, I'm, I'm working on this topic since quite a while. And we as German Energy Agency, um, for example, um, did start a strategy platform in 2011 in which we we're talking about power to gas with hydrogen all that stuff but actually last week my wife my own wife my wife was asking me hey christopher you're talking so much about hydrogen but isn't isn't that this unsafe factor wasn't hydrogen the reason for this explosion of the zeppelin hindenburg um <laughs> some time ago and i don't know whether you you remember this this was 1937 when this explosion okay. took place so in germany um, people today are still referring with hydrogen one single of one of its kind a single um, explosion that is actually 83 years ago so talking about hydrogen in, in in hydrogen security and safety in generation logistics and application is very important but all our technical guys do say well it's not a problem we we have learned about how to um, handle this and mm -hmm. the same as Kim thank you very much as all the other energy carriers you have, just have to make sure that you're holding to the to the safety measures and then it's all fine and this is important for everybody out there to learn so question was now um, how can we increase adoption I mean um, taste in the beginning you were saying okay but it's much much um, easier if you're having existing hydrogen demand today which then can be leader in demand for green hydrogen, for example, if I understood you correctly, Thais. And I'm not sure about whether this is correct, because right now in Germany, we're having about 55 terawatt hours demand in hydrogen. This is mainly demanded by industrial sectors, chemical industries and refineries. And most of these today's um, use cases are with companies or sectors, industry sectors, that do have to face harsh global competition and cost competition. So those sectors might frankly be not the first ones switching over to green hydrogen, might not be, some might be. For example, the, the industry sector of refineries producing um, oil products, um, diesel and gasoline, for example, and they might very well switch over to green hydrogen soon and they might be one of the leading, the, the pushing um, first mover markets then. But what we have, what have we, what do we have to do uh, on an international level? It's very important. We as German Energy Agency are convinced that hydrogen is nothing that we as Germany could do our own. Mm -hmm. So we are not going to produce hydrogen on our own. We're not going to produce the technologies that are needed for generating logistics, stuff, applications on hydrogen on our own. But it has to be a global measure in there, and this is why we as German Energy Agency actually. Um, initiated a global alliance power fuels back then in 2018 in which we were saying hey it's necessary to, to bring together many different actors globally on different supply regions and different demand regions and we are saying that Europe has a special role in there as a leading demand region but hydrogen development in general has to be a global thing and this is why we're so happy that actually we do see movement globally Yes, Kim, thank you very much. South Korea uh, is really pushing hard on hydrogen users. And this, is, this is great. Japan, same way, is really pushing hard on hydrogen users. So we are really happy seeing this. 
And we're really happy seeing that there is movement in Europe right now. So mm -hmm. uh, European Union, European Council is actually preparing the European hydrogen strategy that's being, to, uh, being expected to be published by the end of this year. And we've been asked to participate in this. So, so everybody all over Europe is trying to bring important um, perspectives into that hydrogen strategy. What's important in here is that we make sure that um, we define the value of green um, products, gases, liquid energy carriers, and, and feedstocks. And this is something that has to be done on the European level. I've already said so. And all the rest, we will see what's going on. But we are absolutely positive that there will be a European movement. Last sentence on the German um, national hydrogen strategy. Actually, in there, it, it was also said that um, hydrogen, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm quoting, hydrogen is a collaborative European project. And in the German national hydrogen strategy, it says that we're intensifying EU level activities on research and development, demonstrator projects, investment schemes, and so on. And we're actively seeking bilateral international partnerships between Germany and other countries to find bilateral pilot projects and to fund them actually. And George, you were, you were starting um, throwing money numbers in there. They're, the money numbers that are currently being discussed in all over Europe are really tremendous. So mm -hmm. it, it can't be not a success if we are so much invest, so investing so much in there, not just in money terms, but also in um, cognitive capacity terms. We're investing <laughs> a lot on hydrogen right now. So it should bring us some positive results, hopefully. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Christoph. Uh, conscious of time, uh, I am probably going to ask uh, in that order, Thais, Dr. Kim and George for their one sentence related to the fact how we can get our messages across in order to actually do something on hydrogen. By the way, I love the picture, George. I wish that everyone was such a hydrogen enthusiast as you. Uh, <laughs> brilliant. So shall we start with, with you, Thais? Just, just very quickly, yeah. what can be done? Well, I think what we've been rather successful with doing in Denmark is actually coming back from our initial point showcasing the whole value chain and that this is key to utilizing uh, the renewable potential basically so and that is a, a green value chain but also an economic value chain and that it goes from wind turbine to end user uh, including a lot of industrial in between brilliant thank you so much dr kim a quick sentence Okay, so I think the government role will be very important uh, mm -hmm. because uh, Hydrogen Council was made with 13 companies initially and now it has become 81 company group and many companies are waiting. We made Hydrogen Council because one sector cannot solve the problem. Yeah. So there is automotive sector, energy sector, uh, gas industry, uh, utility. So we had to gather together to solve an, a, any problem. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was a problem. And government, I think, uh, and I want to say that in Hydrogen Council now there's investment group. So many investors are participating. But uh, it will only work when the government shows the clear signal to the industry and the market. So mm -hmm. people will hesitate to invest, even they have money. They will not invest when there is unclear things. Now, uh, German gov government's uh, hydrogen, uh, you know, roadmap, and uh, soon with Europe, I think the in industry and the business people will realize this is really going, and there is the place where you can make money in the future. Yeah. So, if government gives a clear signal and multi-government make a clear signal, then the money will move. Mm -hmm. So, I think that will be the most important thing at the moment. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. George, a quick remark from you. <laughs> so I, I would like us to do what uh, Europe did very successfully in the aerospace industry. Uh, mm -hmm. Got The Americans had 90%, 80% of the market, and we had a fragmented, undercapitalized aerospace industry. And then through Airbus, uh, Europe put together its expertise, and uh, we now have, I think, 70% of the market. Um, I think there's an opportunity for European nations, and I use that phrase specifically, not necessarily just the EU, but European nations, 
to come together and establish a mutual leadership in in the global energy market. And I think we could do something very exciting. And Boris Johnson's been clear that the UK may be leaving the political union, but we don't want to leave the union of uh, pro-market, pro-innovation, pro-science nations. And I'd love to help us put together a a multi-nation, industry-led strategy. Uh, Maybe different countries would lead on different bits, but we could really lower the cost, shatter the cost, Mm -hmm. and lay the foundations for a a new hydrogen industry. Fantastic. Thank you very much, George. So on that note, and knowing that we've got about 10 minutes, um, uh, what I am going to suggest right now is that we do the last poll, uh, which will be about how soon the action is needed. Uh, So that could uh, actually bring some interesting results. And... um, And afterwards, I am going to pick a few really, really interesting questions from the chat. Uh, Just to let everyone know, please don't get offended if I didn't choose your question. There's nothing personal here. Uh, I'm I'm just going kind of through them um, as as received. (laughs) Brilliant. So how long do you think it will take to make hydrogen energy commonplace? A quick vote. Shall we see the results? Right. Seven to 10 years. That's the, that's the, the most preferred response. But uh, actually, three to seven years uh, is just a few percentages below, uh, which basically, you know, without overly simplifying, clearly demonstrates that the action is needed now. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, thank you very much for participating in in this post. That was that was really entertaining. Right now, I'm going to, as mentioned, pick up a few a few questions. There is one we we talked quite a lot about transport, and there is a question related to: Can the panelists describe a possible future scenario for transport, public and personal, and what that could look like? Will it be EVs plus hydrogen? And how does the panel see the car industry responding after so much investment in electric? Uh, so that's a really good one. Uh, I'm not picking up anyone who wants to start. <laughs> Go ahead, George. <laughs> well, it's a great question. And as former Minister for Future of Transport in the UK, it was one that I grappled with. <laughs> my answer to that is that the automotive sector is going through the most phenomenal technological and digital and um, uh, kind of commercial revolution. And we need to help them adjust. And I think there is a a very strong EV market beginning to take shape and it's important. I, I think we should support it. But in parallel, I think we should be investing in hydrogen technology for haulage, for heavy, for buses, for lorries, for trucks, and the technology for trains and ships. And I think that would give, certainly in the UK, that would give us a very strong mixed model. So we don't undermine the automotive industry's investment in electric vehicles. And I think it lays the foundation for a a mixed transport uh, uh, scenario in which some towns could, could have a big hydrogen presence, like total hydrogen with depots and fueling while we build up the, the national distribution system. Fantastic. Thank you so much, George. I'll probably ask Dr. Kim for his op- <laughs> as well, for obvious reasons. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, many people think battery uh, electric cars and hydrogen uh, fuel cell cars are competing, but uh, they will compensate each other because in the future you will have uh, automatically renewable electricity. Uh, for the countries who have plenty of electricity, it would be might be the best way to use battery electric vehicles. But if you have to import a renewable in the hydrogen form, in that kind of country, if you want to, uh, you know, uh, charge EV, you have to produce from hydrogen in the future anyway. Yeah. So uh, hydrogen car will be more effective. Uh, yeah? yeah. Efficient. Yeah. And uh, that is a general, but uh, in the reality. Battery cars are only 2% of the total vehicle market at the moment. Yeah, yeah. and fuel cell only 0.1%. So it is all in the initial phase. So if we, our uh, EVs will grow more than 10 times 
from now on because it is only 2% now. And at the end, there will be only battery EV and fuel cell EV, both. Huh? The market will be shared. Uh, but in my opinion, I think uh, there will be more hydrogen uh, vehicles because uh, we are competing now uh, in the price and the driving range in the passenger car area. But it, uh, for, but in the truck, uh, like 40 ton uh, SA class trucks, there is no other option. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. As I said in the early, uh, in the beginning, uh, I think the only solution is uh, uh, fuel cell technology. And uh, uh, in the big ships also, so uh it will compete in the passenger but who knows you know uh the battery technology was already mature because of the cell phones cell phones produce a yeah. lot of batteries and it is already mature technology but fuel cell it only started in 2013 we were the first car maker to make a uh, mass production uh fuel cell vehicles and it was only 2013 only seven years ago so i think there's a large potential to get the cost down in the fuel cell area so let's see uh, who will be more more efficient? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. But, but but both technology is very early stage. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I my plan is to take two more questions. Uh, however, it's uh, now two to midday, so I just wanted to mention to. Uh, those of you who need to leave at midday, that that's absolutely allowed because we're probably going to overrun by five minutes, which is due to my bad chairing. So apologies for that. Uh, so just quickly, um, the very first question we got relates to how does the hydrogen economy promote an economic transition from hydrocarbon fuel dependency for developing countries where short-term costs continue to outweigh longer-term climate and pollution damage. Any volunteers for that? I can see Christoph nodding. Sorry for putting you in a spotlight. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, not nodding in in the sense of yes. This is an important question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Okay, let's try to find an answer after saying something else. Uh, my, my first impression was after not having found an answer, my, me myself, I was coming to the point, okay, but maybe it's not necessarily the first step in bringing developing countries in there in hydrogen applications. Maybe it's good um, that we as the developed industrial uh, countries yeah. are pushing forward, making sure that the application areas are developing and this allowing cost aggression on uh, both the generation side as well as the application side of hydrogen application. So it might be a good idea that industrial countries are pushing forward and developing countries are then following later after having the cost aggression effects already being taken into place or come, coming to place. Might be one part of the solution in there. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a couple of um, ideas that are discussed right now um, um, for example, setting up funds that can be used in developed countries that allows them um, to at, at least to make best use of investment money that today is depreciated with higher rates in developing countries due to higher risk factors. And those higher risk factors are then reduced by specific funds for development and, and investments in those hydrogen applications. Such a fund idea uh, funds idea is currently being discussed in Germany at least and um, whether we're able to set up such a fund uh, that could then allow us uh, allow developing countries to also jump on this train of technological development might be a one idea brilliant thank you very much Christoph uh, so as mentioned the very last question from the chat relates to there's a few more so apologies to all of you uh, and, you know, we'll, we'll make sure to, to forward your questions to all the, all the speakers for their information. And, and obviously we can follow up later on. However, the one that I would pick uh, relates to the following. So hydrogen is infamous for undergoing hype cycles and detractors point to this when, uh, and detractors to this when considering the present interest in hydrogen. Do you have a counter argument for this point of view? Go ahead, Thais. Yeah. 
Well, I think that is absolutely correct that that has been the case historically. But but we're, I'd argue a little bit to my also as I mentioned, we're in a completely different place now, uh, both in terms of the technology. But that's one thing. But more in the environment that we're actually in, that we have a climate crisis. We did in the past as well, but there we didn't recognize it. Uh, but now it's 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 being recognized. We have. Um, uh, the uh, cost of uh, renewables that are dropping very fast, luckily, uh, and we have a completely different set of political uh, um, ambition uh, and engagement. Uh, could be more in different countries, etc. But and uh, unseen uh, development over the last 24 months for that, and as I said, so that creates a, a much more um, sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, for hydrogen to move forward. The need is bigger than ever before, but the opportunities uh, in terms of the actual renewable feedstock and uh, the recognition that we need to, to change uh, our, our energy system at the fossil fuels is not really the competition that we have to, we have to give them up anyway. Uh, so, so there is another sense of urgency, thank God. Uh, it could be stronger, but it's, that is, uh, in my perspective, the, the very big change uh, and difference to uh, in, when you compare with the, what I agree has been previous hypes and yeah, the hydrogen society in the mid 90s, yeah. etc. But we're in a different place now. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. And um, so I am actually going to try at least to conclude this brilliant session we had today. Uh, so, you know, without overly simplifying, we have probably concluded that the opportunity is now and we have to grab it. There is a number of barriers to overcome, but actually hydrogen presents a wonderful opportunity for a truly global cooperation. So on that note, I just wanted to finish with a quote from our own Committee on Climate Change that also produced a report on hydrogen. And actually, I find this, this quote quite brilliant, and it says that if hydrogen is to play a substantial long-term role, process towards deployment of low-carbon hydrogen at scale must start now. Deployment of hydrogen should start in a low-regrets way over the next decade, recognizing that even an imperfect rollout is likely to be better in the long term than a wait-and-see approach that fails option properly. So on that note, I wanted to thank you all for your participation and to our brilliant, brilliant speakers. You have been absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much. And once again, a massive thanks to the organizers for, for having all of us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank it was you. a pleasure. Bye. Yeah, bye, -bye.